I'd just like to thank Qantas for inviting me to, to come and speak and to share some of my data that, uh, that we've used the Qantas kits and kind of see the, the way that we've used it uh, in our, our mouse model that we use. And so the title of my presentation will be Influenza Virus Infected Mice Treated with Oseltamivir and then specifically focusing on those insights that we gained from cytokines. And I kind of title it that way because our project was not designed to be used with cytokines. At the time that, we, that I started my project, we didn't have any idea that we were going to go in this direction. And so it was kind of an afterthought, but we, I'm, I'm excited with the way that it turned out and with the, the information that we gained from it. So, first, just a little bit about our institute that I work for. I'm a, a PhD student up here, as well as a full-time employee at the Institute for Antiviral Research. We're just located just a couple buildings uh, to the north of this building. There, we're a group of about 44 employees. Uh, we have six uh, principal investigators that work there. Um, and then we also have a couple of postdoctoral fellows as well as full-time technicians. And then we also rely heavily on the, the Utah State campus for a source of student uh, workers to come on and to do our part-time help. So, so we, it, being on campus has been a big benefit for that. A little bit about the Institute. Uh, it was established in, uh, over the past 25 years. The Institute has been responsible for about $60 million in federal funding. Uh, we are also a member of the NIH, the National Institute of Health, the Collaborative Antiviral Testing Group. And so as part of that grant, we have a contract with the NIH to test uh, novel small molecules um, in both in vitro and um, in vivo models uh, for potential development into pharmaceutical agents. And so we do the initial screening of these compounds to hopefully progress towards uh, an F FDA testing and approval. Uh, we've also, they've also been collaborating on over 400 peer-reviewed publications. And we also have antiviral and vaccine testing. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my mentor, Bart Tarbett, got a grant to, uh, from the NIH to do vaccine testing as well. And so we will do this initial vaccine testing for uh, small companies as well. Uh, we have animal models established for approximately 30 different human pathogens that we work with. So a little bit about influenza virus. If, if everyone here is not in, uh, already familiar with influenza, it's of the, the family Orthomyxoviridae. It's an enveloped virus. It's a negative sense single-stranded RNA virus that's a, a zoonotic, zoonotic pathogen. Birds are the natural host. We sometimes think that it's humans, but it's actually the main reservoir for influenza is in birds. And then the viruses are transmitted to other animals uh, to eventually infect humans. Um, poultry, we often hear about poultry being infected with avian influenza. Pigs, uh, if you remember a few years ago when they had the swine influenza, or the swine flu outbreak. Uh, and then those infections in those other animals allow the, the virus to reassort and to be able to infect humans. There are three basic genres of influ influenza viruses. There's influenza A, B, and C. Um, we won't talk anything about really B or C today. C is not very important for human infections. Um, and B does cause human disease, but it doesn't seem to be as severe as influenza A. So the, the focus of this research was influenza virus A. A little bit more about the influenza virus, the, the structure of the virus. The virus is an enveloped virus, as I have stated. And it has two major proteins that are on the surface of the virus. The, the hemagglutin, or the HA protein, and then the neuraminidase, or the NA protein. And those two proteins make up the bulk of the protein on the outside of this virus. The hemagglutin protein is responsible for binding of the virus to the receptor to allow it to infect. The neuraminidase protein is responsible for allowing the virus to escape. Um, well, I'll talk a little bit more about the influenza virus life cycle and how that works. Um, but the neuraminidase protein is involved in, in helping that virus escape from the infected the, the host cell. And then each of these influenza viruses will be classified on based on the type of hemagglutin and neuraminidase protein that they have. And so I think for hemagglutin, I think there's 15 total proteins, so H1 through H15, and then I think the neuraminidase, it goes up to 9 if I remember. <coughs> and so each virus will be given a characteristic designation based on the, the two types of proteins, like for example H1N1 or H3N2. So here's a, a diagram of the, the replication of the influenza virus. You can see up here in the top corner is the binding of the virus or absorption of the virus into the host cell. This large cell would be our host cell. 
And then this, I like this diagram because it also shows the potential therapeutic targets for development of, of, of molecules. And so the first one is these adamantine, adamantine derivatives. Um, adam, adamantine is a small molecule that actually prevents uncoating of the virus. It clogs up one of the ion channels on the surface of the virus and prevents the virus from uncoating. Unfortunately, right now, most of the viruses are resistant to adam, um, amantadine, and so it's become a little bit less of a, a le little bit less attractive target unless we can find some kind of a compound that will block, uh, still block that channel and prevent that, that step um, in resistant viruses. Um, last I heard, it was over 90% of the viruses that are isolated are resistant to amantadine and, and that step right there. Uh, the virus then uncoats after uh, the uh, depolarization of the, the proteins, and then it goes in and replicates, and there's different steps here that we're going to talk about. We're not going to talk too much about these ones today. And then after the, the new virion, the genetic material is produced, it is escorted to the surface of the cell, and then it buds from the virus. And so it's a budding virus, not a lytic virus. Um, there's two different types of viruses. Some viruses will cause the cell to actually rupture and release the, the infectious virions, Influenza actually has to take part of that membrane with it as it leaves to be able to become an infectious virion. If the cell is lysed before that time, the, the virus will not be infectious. And so it actually has to take it, and you can see that it's taking part of that membrane with it as it goes. So it's taking part of that host membrane. And then the part that we're going to focus on right here is this neuraminidase inhibitors. And this is the, the neuraminidase enzyme actually comes in here and cleaves that connection that keeps that virion still attached to that cell. And so the, the drug that we're going to talk about today uh, is oseltamivir, which is a neuraminidase inhibitor, and it will actually prevent that enzyme from functioning. And so because of that, the virus actually is able to infect the cell, it replicates inside the cell, and then as it tries to escape, it's prevented from escaping, and so it can infect any other cells. And so because of that, um, it's a little bit, it seems it's very late in the life cycle to be start to targeting a virus. It's right before it's infectious. And so the, to, for this to actually work, the virus actually has to infect and then try and escape. So for treatment of influenza, there's a couple of different options. Uh, first, there's uh, biological options, such as vaccine, vaccines that are generally prophylactic. Most people are familiar with getting a flu shot or possibly a, a nasal flu vaccine. And so there's, there's those ways to, get, to, become, to gain immunity to influenza. Uh, the other option, which most people don't know about, most people think if they go into the doctor that they, they'll just say, oh, you have flu, you just need to tough it out and get over it. There is actually options for pharmaceuticals that are approved right now that you can use, um, and they are given after illness. There's also other things that, that other therapeutic options that we have, uh, non-traditional uses of vaccines and therapeutics. Um, vaccines are currently being developed for the treatment of disease, so the things that we, can be given afterwards. Um, we've also heard about vaccines being used to prevent cancer or to treat cancer, uh, vaccines to prevent chronic diseases, um, such as hypertension, Al Alzheimer's, and obesity. And then there's also therapeutics that can be developed for the prevention of disease. So this is our little furry friend, and I'll, I'll tell you why we should care about our, our little furry friend. Most of the, the presentations we've heard today have been about human medicine. Um, we work with an animal model of a human pathogen. And so this is the, uh, a mouse that we would normally use for our, our influenza model. And so what we do is we take this mouse and we infect it with a strain of influenza. And then we monitor different things in the mouse to be able to, to monitor the severity of the disease. Um, a mouse is not a natural host for influenza virus. And so we have to look at some different things than we might look at in a human. In a human, one of the big indicators for influenza is running a fever. If we infect mice with influenza, they do not get a fever. There's no febrile response. And so we have to look at other ways to, to indicate how severe that infection is. Uh, one of the big ones that we look at is weight loss following infection. Uh, the more severe an infection, the more weight that the mice will lose. We also look at pneumonia in the lung. Uh, we'll actually, when we run our studies, we will sacrifice mice post-infection and then weigh the lungs and we also score them. Uh, when we weigh them, we'll put them on a balance, and, and the amount that the lung weighs, we actually uh, will, when we will compare it to a control mouse. The higher the lung weight indicates consolidation of the lungs, that the, the lung is actually being infected and it's uh, 
Cells are infiltrating the lung and increasing the weight. So there's more <coughs> inflammation and consolidation that's happening. And so our lung weights can actually give us an indicator of how severe that disease is in the mouse. Uh, we also are able to, to measure, measure viral replication in the lung. Um, our current method for doing that is that we will rinse the lungs with uh, sterile saline, and then we can actually pull that saline back out, and we can titer influenza virus from the, the saline that we rinsed into their lungs. We also have a veterinary diagnostic lab on campus, and we're able to send samples to them for histopathology. Uh, we also look at cytokine, cytokine measurements. This has become a, a fairly st uh, standard procedure for us. Uh, one of the things that we're just starting to look into is uh, phenotyping the cellular infiltrates into the lungs to measure the different kinds of cells that are actually being produced by the body and responding to that infection in the lungs. Uh, another thing that's been kind of a, a new cutting edge thing that we do is actually plethysmography, where we're measuring lung, lung function by putting the mouse in a small container where we can measure their respiration volumes. And so we actually can, we have a small chamber that has a little sensor on it, and we can actually measure the breath of the, that the mouse is taking. And in response to infection, the mouse will actually alter its breathing to compensate for the infection in its lungs. And so we've actually been able to determine that there's a correlation between the decreased, decreased plethysmography signals and the infection. And then obviously we look at mortality. Um, so we look at whether or not this virus is able to actually kill the mice. So going back to our, our drugs now, uh, one of the ones that you can ask for in the clinic that most people don't know about is Tamiflu. Um, it's a, a neuromidase inhibitor that's given and it's been proven to shorten the duration of influenza virus symptoms. Um, it can be given as a prophylactic when the swine flu outbreak happened in 2009, that was a very, um, it was something that they did quite a bit at the time, is that if, if you knew someone in your family had, uh, had been diagnosed as having that swine flu virus, uh, they would give other family members this uh, Tamiflu to, be, to prevent them from getting infection from the sick person. Um, it can be given as, a, it's given as a treatment twice a day for five days. Um, the, the problem with Tamiflu is that there's a, since it targets the virus very late in the life cycle, you have to get that, catch that infection very early on. And so the, that's really been the, the problem with measuring the effectiveness of, effectiveness of Tamiflu, is that you have to catch the infection in the very early stages of the, of the infection, usually within the first 48 hours to be able to, to use this effectively. Well, the problem is, is if most of us, if we get sick, we don't run to the doctor as soon as we get sick. We try and tough it out, and then by the time we go make it to the doctor, we've been sick for five, six, or seven days. And at that point, the virus is spread so systemically throughout your body, it's hard to be able to, to control it by just preventing, preventing it from spreading. And so, because of that, we wanted to look at the effectiveness of Tamiflu in our mouse model. Um, and we had noticed that the effectiveness of this, this compound varied depending on the virus that we used. And so we would, uh, decided to set up a, a mouse study for my master's research where we looked at these four viruses. So the first one is an, uh, an AWS at 33 virus, which is an H1N1, a seasonal H1N1. Um, this one was first isolated in 1933. It's a, one of the first influenza viruses that was ever isolated. It's very well characterized and has been used in labs around the country for pretty much since 1933 that they've used that. Um, so it's a very well characterized virus. Uh, the second one that we used was uh, an A. Victoria 375, which is an H3N2 virus. We had previously noted that this was fairly lethal, and especially with oseltamivir. We also wanted to look at an H5N1. Um, an H5N1 would typically be what people would refer to as an avian influenza. This one is a, a low pathogenic strain. It's not one that we have to work with in a, in a BSL-3 laboratory but it still causes fairly significant disease. And then because it was a, a significant interest at the time, it continues to be a fascinating virus, we threw in the A California 07-2009, which was a pandemic H1N1. This would be representative of the swine flu virus. And so this was our pandemic virus that um, we used to kind of round out the panel and make it a little more relevant to the, some of the newer viruses. Uh, this virus is actually one that is currently in the influenza vaccine that you get and has been since 2009 after they, they released that vaccine. And so this virus is still prevalent today and is still the, the dominant H1N1 that's causing disease today.
So as I said, we had noticed uh, discrepancies in our, in our results based on which viruses we were using. And so we noticed that with this H1N1, which was that NWS virus, that we were able to protect 11 of 12 mice with just one milligram per kilogram, which is uh, lower than the therapeutic dose that would be given to a human. For the H3N2, we only protected six out of 10 mice with a dose of 50 milligrams per kilogram. And then the H5N1, uh, we failed to protect any mice with a dose of 100 milligrams per kilogram. So you can see a wide discrepancy in the amount of protection offered by oseltamivir challenged with three different viruses. This data was actually from two separate studies. And so because of that, we didn't have a good head-to-head -head comparison of oseltamivir in our mouse model. And so we decided to, to round that out and add the, add, keep these three viruses and then add the pandemic H1N1 as a fourth virus to compare how oseltamivir would be able to protect these mice. And the important thing to note is that none of these viruses are actually resistant to oseltamivir. Uh, it is possible that if viruses are treated, are exposed to oseltamivir, they can develop a resistance to it. Uh, but none of these viruses were actually resistant, and so they all should have been protected, all of them should have been protected, especially with these higher doses of oseltamivir. So our study design is, uh, this is how we outline our studies to, to set them up for our animal technicians. And so we have a placebo-treated group that we had um, quite a few mice in each one. We had a lot of mice in these groups because we wanted to sacrifice mice at various time points to be able to, to do a lot of different measurements with them. And so we had pretty large numbers of mice in each group. We were looking for a total of 15 for just survival analysis and weight loss. And so we had 15 set aside just as uh, mortality. And then the other 30 we were planning on sacrificing at time points. <coughs> and so we observed them for weight loss and death, and then we also sacrificed them at days 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And we were looking at lung virus titers, lung weights, lung scores, and then we also added um, histopathology and cytokine measurements. We also had a group that we treated with 5 milligrams per kilogram of oseltamivir. Uh, we had another group that we treated with 40 milligrams per kilogram. We chose these doses based on hoping to get some protection. We didn't want 100% protection with oseltamivir. We wanted to see where oseltamivir was failing and where it was, which viruses it would still protect and which ones it would not. And then we also had control mice for each of those groups that we sacrificed at the same time points to be able to, to compare our measurements back to our, our control mice. And then we also had five mice down here at the bottom that we just observed for weight gain so that we would have a normal comparison over the, the course of the study. And so we repeated that same study design, and we had four different viruses that we used. And so that number of mice that we had was actually times four, because we had to repeat that for each virus that we used. And so we took our little mouse friend here, we infected him with each, uh, in each study we infected him with one of the four viruses, and then we treated them with oseltamivir or our placebo, our three different treatments were here. Uh, it was a, a PO or an oral treatment of the drug. And then uh, we sacrificed our mice post-infection at each of those days. Um, our lungs were scored in weight on each of those days. And then we also homogenized our lung tissues for titers and cytokines. Uh, we also looked at, afterwards, we looked at additional parameters, mortality, uh, body weight change following infection, and then also our cytokine measurements. So as you look at the, our survival curves here, you can see that if we don't treat the mice at all, these are all our placebo groups, so I decided to combine the results from all the different, the four different studies onto one graph to make it easy to compare each of the viruses. And so you can see that all of the mice eventually die. Um, actually, most of them right here around day 9 and 10, that, that we've got a similar day of death, mean day of death for all of these, these viruses. Um, but then when, when they're not treated at all, we had a lethal infection with all four of our viruses. Then when we added oseltamivir at 5 milligrams per kilogram, which was our lower dose of oseltamivir, you can see it's actually that it started to separate out some of these differences here. And so now we've got our H3N2, which is actually down here on the bottom, that we only had one mouse that actually survived that infection at that lower dose of oseltamivir. And then we had our H5N1 virus here right in the middle, where about half of the mice were actually able to survive that infection. And then you can see our two H1N1, our H1N1, the seasonal, and then the pandemic H1N1, they were 100% protected from infection. And so even the lower dose of oseltamivir was able to, to show that, that protection of, from mortality. 
When we treated with 40 milligrams per kilogram, the interesting thing is that we did not see a dose response with the H5N1. Again, about half the mice survived. The H3N2, we actually saw a, a big increase in protection for mortality with the H3N2 virus. And again, as we'd expect, both of our H1N1 viruses are up at the top, that they're, they were protected from that infection. And so the problem that we had is that from this data, I really couldn't see what was different about them. It didn't, it didn't allow us a lot of insight into what was different about these viruses or how the infection was different. And so we started, I looked at, uh, at weight loss as well, and you can see that they all lose, lose weight in about the same manner, that they're losing weight about the same rate. Um, we initially uh, threw out the hypothesis that possibly one of the viruses replicated much faster and caused weight loss much more severely, and so the oseltamivir could not protect it. Um, but according to our, our weight loss graph, they all lose weight about the same as the other ones. And then our control mice are up here, you can see the control mice are slowly gaining weight as, they're, uh, as the experiment continues. Now if we add our oseltamivir at 5 milligrams per kilogram, this is where it actually starts to get interesting. You can see our control mice are up here at the top, and then the interesting thing is that our H1N1 that is our older virus, is up here protected. It, the five milligrams per kilogram completely protected them from weight loss. They started to gain weight roughly comparable to the placebos, or to the uninfected mice. Well, our pandemic H1N1, they actually still lost weight. There was a significant infection where we're showing that they're still infected, but they're, they didn't die. And so that was a, it was an important part of that study, realizing that the, the pandemic H1N1 was still causing weight loss but the mice were still protected from mortality. And then you can see with the, the H3 and the H5 that both of those drop out pretty quickly and then the few mice start to gain weight here towards the end as they've survived the infection. And so you can see that the oseltamivir, that lower dose of oseltamivir, is able to prevent <coughs> some of that weight loss, especially in that, the, the older H1N1 virus. And then it's a similar trend if we, add, if we take the oseltamivir all the way up to 40 milligrams per kilogram, you can see that the older H1N1 mice are just right there with the uninfected. The, according, they don't even know that they're really sick. So, But the, the pandemic H1N1 is still right here in the middle, and then our H3 and H5 are on the bottom. So the, after looking at the, the survival and the weight loss, we didn't really have a good indicator of what was happening or, or what was causing that to, to be more severe. And so one of the things that we looked at, and this was about the time that we had gotten in touch with Quantis is that we decided to look at cytokine measurements from those. Um, and because of cost, we couldn't look at every time point in every group. And so we looked at just days two, four, and six, um, which we had already identified as, as key days of cytokine production and indicators of infection. And then we just compared the two groups, the placebo and then the oseltamivir at 40 milligrams per kilogram. We really wanted to see if that, if the oseltamivir had a, an effect on the cytokine production. Um, and so we homogenized our lung samples uh, just in minimum essential media. And then we also then, then we decided to compare all of our infected samples to control mice. Uh, we also had those control mice to compare our infected samples. And so this is the, the kit we used. We just used the, the mouse cytokine, the 16-plex kit from Quonsys. Um, and we've had uh, good success with that kit and being able to, to see those some of these cytokines that are greatly upregulated following influenza infection. So there were some challenges with this one because this was one of the first times that we had run this kit. And so, as uh, they mentioned earlier, <coughs> that, uh, the people who didn't have a lot of experience with this kit, these were some of the first plates that I had run. And so the initial problem that we had was what, how do we visualize that large amount of data? I mean, even on a smaller study, which I was working on, it became very difficult to, to interpret all those all that data and all the interactions and what was happening, um, especially with cytokines where they have these pleiotropic effects. It's hard to tell what exactly that means. If IL-1 alpha comes up a little bit on day two, what does that mean? Does it mean that the mouse is sick or is that normal? And so uh, we experimented with a couple different ways of, of looking at that data. And the first way that I started out was looking at bar graphs. Uh, we also had the idea to look at heat maps, one of the other uh, graduate students looked at a heat map version of, of looking at the cytokines, similar to like you'd see with like a DNA or a gene array, is looking at that uh, to see what is upregulated and what is downregulated. Um, and eventually what we came to focus on after hearing a presentation two years ago at this conference is to look at full changes from our control samples. Uh, there was a group out of the University of Miami that looked at 
They started comparing all their cytokines rather than trying to compare different groups to each other and decide what was relevant. They looked at full changes from normal, and so they kept they kept an extensive list of all their control their control samples, and then they compared their test samples back to those control samples as kind of a, an in-house reference to understand what was really happening. And so we, we were looking for, at this time, we also decided we would look for an indi early indicator of influenza disease. So we wanted to see if there was something that would let us know how severe that infection is early on. If there's some kind of a marker that's produced that, that we can use as a biomarker. And one that was suggested in 2012 was IL-6. And so we were interested in that one. We were glad that it was in our, in our data there to be able to compare it. And then we also decided to look for other potential markers. Uh, the two that we're going to end up kind of focusing on today are IL-6 and MCP-1. And so the, the, the first way I started looking at it was with these bar graphs, and I intentionally kept these in here because they're not very pretty. <laughs> and as I've gone back and had to work with it, it's, uh, you, can see it's, you can see that cytokines are upregulated. And at the time, I was trying to find differences between the viruses. And so I was trying to compare the, the H1N1 pandemic-infected mice compared to the, the H5N1 infected mice. And it became very tedious to try and keep track of which, which ones were more significant than others and what that all meant. And so that's kind of what I wanted you to see from these, these graphs is that as we looked at the cytokines, you can see that they're upregulated. I mean, our control mice are down here at the bottom. You can see that there's clearly an increase in these cytokines, but it's difficult to interpret that. And so I did like that it was a simple presentation that anybody can look at and see that the cytokines are increased or if they're, or if they're decreased compared to control mice. Um, I had trouble trying to compare between groups until I figured out a better way to do that. And then the other problem that, uh, the other thing that I didn't like is that our control mice are often vastly different from our infected mice, especially where we're de dealing with a very severe influenza infection. You can see here that our control mice, that's almost nothing, that there's just almost no signal for IL-6, which we would expect since IL-6 is produced in response to an, uh, an inflammatory response. And then you can see our, our pandemic H1N1 is all the way up here around 50,000 picograms. Um, and we also normalized it for grams of lung tissue because we had homogenized the samples. And so you can see there's just a vast difference which makes it hard to really tell what, what, how meaningful that is. Is 50,000 you know, 50, that much more meaningful than you know, 10 or 12,000? Is that a really an indicator of a more severe infection? And so we switched to looking at heat maps, which I did like that you can use control mice as a baseline. So we were looking at full change from our control mice. Um, and then we assigned a color for each value. Uh, I did like that it allows us to see a large amount of the data at once. You can get an overall picture of how things are working and how, uh, where things are, are located, which cytokines are upregulated, which ones are not really affected. Uh, you can see, you know, IL-3, eh, there's not a whole lot going on there. IL-5 at day four and six, there's almost nothing. So these full changes, they're, they're just not very much from uh, different from our control lines. Um, and the thing that I did like is it did allow, us to, allow me to see the trends that were visible there. And so the one that I picked out from this was that we were already looking at IL-6 as a potential marker. But then I saw this bright red spot here for MCP-1. And I saw that this was upregulated actually in all four of our placebo lines. And so you can see as we compared them, that the... The challenging part, though, is then comparing against multiple different viruses to be able to, to see that. You can see that's a lot of data. You can see that MCP1, though, and this is what I wanted you to see, is that in placebo-treated mice, MCP1 is, is highly upregulated, greater than 100-fold higher than control mice at day two in all four of those viruses. And so that's, well, that's what I was hoping for, is that I could find something in there that was the same in all of them in a placebo-treated mouse. Then as we look at it when treated with oseltamivir, I looked back at MCP1, and now I started to see differences. And so IL-6, I looked at that one a little bit, but it didn't. Re it was impacted a little bit by oseltamivir treatment, but it wasn't greatly reduced. But then MCP1, you can see that it's reduced. It used to be that red color, and now it's gone down to orange in our 2H1N1. And in our H3 and 2 and in our H5, even when treated with oseltamivir, we're same, still getting that same high concentration of MCP1. So the HEMAPs did help us to identify MCP1 as a potential indicator. Uh, it was significantly increased on day two. We were hoping for some kind of an early indicator. Um, it's nice to be able to see all that data, but then it's also hard to make comparisons where you're just looking at kind of colors. But it does allow you to focus in on those key cytokines. 
Um, and then it, the, the problem is that this can be difficult for complicated studies. Um, the heat map required a lot more manipulation of the data to get it into that point. And so I, I haven't focused on doing that a lot because of the, the amount of extra effort that's uh, required for that. Um, just to give you kind of an example, one of our recent vaccine studies that we just <coughs> completed, uh, we had 18 different vaccination groups plus our normal controls for a total of 19 different groups. We had five different days of infection, two different sacrifice days post-infection, which gave us a total of eight, 80 different cytokine data sets. And so for that reason, I really haven't told Mark that I was willing to make heat maps for all of these different studies that we're doing, <laughs> because it would turn into so many heat maps that it would become quite tedious. But, uh, but it did allow us to, to find that, that increase in MCP1. And so as we kind of looked at IL-6, um, we looked at this as a kind of an initial indicator. And the, the problem that we found is that even though it was reported in, in the literature as being a good indicator, we found that at least in our model, that it's not always upregulated to the same extent. And so you can see that in our placebo-treated mice here, and now we're looking at a full change from control mice, that MC, the, the IL-6 is upregulated in both of the H1N1s very highly, but it's less so in the H3N2 and the H5N1. And so you can see that when we treat with oseltamivir, some of that goes away, but it's still, still highly upregulated in this H1N1, the pandemic H1N1. And so we found that in only in about 50% of our studies, even with the same virus, even with this pandemic H1N1, which uh, we've used quite a bit, we found that only in about 50% of, uh, of our studies is that IL-6 consistently upregulated to that extent. Um, and it, it can be important because IL-6 has a couple of different functions. It, um, it, functions, it functions in lymphocyte activation, also in antibody production, production uh, fever, which we don't see in the mice, uh, but then it also is responsible for acute phase protein production. So we, we did see those increased at day two, as you can see right there, uh, but it was only in two of the four viruses. Um, both of the H1N1s, after oseltamivir treatment, we can see that it was reduced, especially in those, the, the older H1N1. Um, and it, the, the important thing is I was looking for something to correlate it back to the mortality and the body weights. And the, the increases in IL-6 that I saw didn't correlate back to those, those earlier data that I was looking at. And so it, uh, for me, at least, it didn't work out to be a very good indicator of the severity of the infection. And so now as we look at MCP1, you can see that it's significantly increased in all four of these viruses at day two. We've got that strong upregulation of MCP1. And then it also seems to correlate with the, infer the severity of the infection. And so now you can see that down here in this lower graph, that is they're treated with oseltamivir, we can see that down here where it's, it's upregulated, that it still produces mortality. That both of these viruses, the H3 and the H5, even when treated with oseltamivir, they still were tied to mortality, that they still had significant mortality. Um, and what the interesting thing was too is that the amount of upregulation also seemed to tie, correlate to the severity as well. So if there was a hundredfold increase of that, of MCP1, it seemed to be tied to a lethal infection, or at least potential lethality. As you can see here, we're right around a hundredfold and we saw, you know, about half of the mice died with the H5N1. The H3 there was better survival, but it was still a, a really severe infection as we saw from the weight loss. And then if we saw just about a 30-fold increase, which was this H1N1, the pandemic H1N1, that was a 30-fold increase, we saw it was non-lethal, but they still lost weight from the infection. And then if there was only a 10-fold increase, which is this, the, the older H1N1, that seemed to indicate that it was protected from mortality and weight loss. And so that seems to indicate that up to a certain point, there, there has to be that MCP1 that's produced that's beneficial. And that after that point, if it's above 10-fold, it's such a severe infection that that MCP1 may not be helping to actually clear that infection at all. And so just to kind of clue you in on the <laughs> functions of MCP1, uh, it's also known as CCL2. Um, it's recruitment of monocytes, memory T cells, and dendritic cells to the sites of in infection. Um, and also more recently, as I looked through the literature, it's been indicated as a potential, uh, potential marker for severe infection. And so I found two different studies, one with a, a PR834, which is an H1N1 virus. It's very similar to the, the NWS virus. Um, but they found that that early cytokine dysregulation of MCP1 was tied to a severe infection. And that they also found that um, in, uh, in other mice infected with an H7N9, 
which is a highly pathogenic virus, uh, that if that, the increased expression of MCP1 was tied to lung damage and mortality. So kind of our, our, our goal is now is where do we go from here and, and where do we, we take our studies? And so since this was only the result of one study, we need uh, to repeat these studies to confirm our initial uh, findings and then possibly test additional viruses. We have quite a few other viruses in our collection. Um, not as many for the mouse model, but we have additional viruses that we can test and see if we can get that same indication of MCP1, that same upregulation and tie that to mortality and, and uh, weight loss. And then also, as I, I mentioned, we, we used, uh, we homogenized the lung tissue, which is after we, after we have done the study, we had come to learn that there's better ways to do that. And so rather than homogenizing these lungs and releasing all these cytokines that may not have been being produced at that endothelial surface of the lungs, uh, we now utilize a bronchial alveolar, alveolar lavage technique, um, which is a more accurate indicator of what's happening in the lungs. And so we actually take that sterile saline, as I said, and rinse it down into the lungs. Um, since my study was performed a little while ago, we didn't use that technique. And so I would like to repeat that study and, and use that technique to see if the, if the same thing holds true. And then possibly confirm that in different mouse strains. Um, the, the mice that we used were valve C mice, which are genetically predisposed to a Th2 response, a Th2 immune response. Um, but we would also test that possibly in like a C57 black or a Swiss Webster, which is an outbred mouse. Uh, to, to confirm if this indicator, if MCP1 can work as an indicator in these, in these other mouse strains as well. And then always we're looking for novel ways to look at that data. If there's any better way to, to interpret that data or to, to make sense of the, this large amount of data that we have. Um, that seems to be our biggest challenge is that we, we get all this data and then knowing what to make of it. And so uh, any novel methods that we can use to, to interpret that and then hopefully use that to, to correlate it to the, the data that we already have. So just to acknowledge just my committee and those who, who helped on our, our study and I'll grab any questions. <laughs>